Well, tonight we're going to talk about the relationship between grace and grace. Now, some of you are saying, sorry, Scott, I'm having a hard time hearing. The relationship between grace and grace, it sounded like you said the same word twice. Well, it is true that the words that I used were somewhat similar, but as you can see even here on the screen, there is grace and there are grays. Now, even as I get a little older in life, I, you know, think of some of the grays in my life and I need more grace as a result of those things. Every once in a while, my wife will point one of those out to me or many of those out to me, but it's just a reminder that there is a difference between those two words and you see grace. The word grace, it's God's unmerited favor. It is his unearned love that we have. And the book of Romans has made it very clear that we are saved by love, not by law, by grace. And the grays, well, G-R-A-Y-S, if you think about that spelling there, it's the subtle shades of color that lie between black and white. And this is the point of the passage that we study tonight, the chapter that we look at, which is that God gives us grace for the grays. And he expects us to do the same for others. God gives us grace for the grace, and he expects us to do the same in the lives of others. See, the scriptures were written in black and white, if you have them there in front of you, and of course also sometimes the words of Christ in red. But it's not just the black ink and the white page that I'm talking about. I'm talking about the ideas and the issues that are discussed in the scriptures. You see them in very clear contrast, don't you? <laughs> Deeds of darkness, a life of light. You see words like saved and lost. Heaven and hell, good and evil, dead and sin, alive in Christ. These are clear contrasts, not a lot of gray areas there. And Jesus, he spoke in very clear and compelling ways. He said, you're either for me or you're against me. Not really a mushy middle there, no neutrality. He said, if you'll receive me, you will have life. But if you reject me, you will die in your sins. And he said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So those are certainly words that are black and white. They don't leave a lot of wiggle room for people, though people try to wiggle around those sometimes. They are not gray matters in the scripture. And we live in a society that wants to make everything some subtle shade of gray. I don't want anything to be crystal clear. I want it all to be relative. No absolute truths, no black and white. But see, the Bible, God's word is not ashamed to take that absolute stand on a standard, to call something right and to call something wrong, and to call us to live in those ways when we are living right. See, the Bible comes right out and says sin is sin. It says things like this, murder is sin. And most of us would say, yeah, that's, that's good. Lying is sin. Selfishness is sin. Stealing is sin. Adultery and fornication are sin. Pride is sin. And, of course, the list goes on. But there's also many things that are listed in the Bible as good. Praying is good. Bible study is good. Love is good. Patience is good. Kindness is good. Humility is good. And the Bible, again, is not ashamed to say this when it comes to the gospel of grace, that it really doesn't have any grays in it. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus alone. So simple for us to see. And so the Bible is written in black and white. Yes, right and wrong. And you see the deeds of darkness, again, contrasted with a life of light. But here's the thing. Even once we personally embrace grace, all of us may still have a few nagging questions in our mind. What about the grays, though? Aren't there some gray areas of life? Aren't there some subtle shades to some of these things? I mean, I'm clear on the really, really right, and I'm clear on the really, really wrong. But what about all the stuff in between? I mean, what about the gray areas? How am I supposed to deal with those? What about all the things that are not so black and white in life? What about the areas where the scriptures are silent or maybe even inconclusive? What about the times when two equally sincere believers come to opposite conclusions about the same subject? Who's right? Who's wrong in that case? Well, as we will see in this chapter, it's possible for someone to be right and still be wrong. Someone can be right, still be wrong. But you know what? This is fascinating to me. It's possible for a person to be wrong about some minor matter and still be right with God. Isn't that great? Isn't that uh, understanding that we need to have? 
Now, what does this matter to us? Well, it matters a whole lot because, see, I think most people, when you really get down to it, what do we consider to be the most important things in life? Well, relationships, certainly. Hopefully, your relationship with God is something you consider important. And hopefully, the relationships that you have with others are important to you. And see, this is absolutely crucial as it relates to relationships. See, the common thing that people say about Christianity is, oh, it's not a religion, it's a relationship. And that's a true statement. But what does it really mean? What it really means at the heart of it is that not everything is absolutely crystal clear, black and white, in the sense that there isn't some long legalistic list somewhere that someone just says, okay, I check off my little checklist and I'm a Christian. That's all I do. These are the things I do. It's all right there in front of me. No? Again, the Bible says we're saved by grace, not by perfect performance to some absolute standard. And if I get everything right, then I'm going to be okay with God. See, that's what religion is, is some set of standards that if you can do this enough, then you'll be okay with God. But a relationship is built on love, not legalism. And so what you see is the Bible not being a comprehensive law library like some people want to make it. You ever been to someone's office and they have just books, 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 and you think, does anyone read these things? Does anyone care about these things? But what these are is more laws to deal with every loophole. If somebody comes up with something, they come up with another book. Okay, we'll just write another law to try and keep people under this stuff. But see, that's not the Bible. It's been written as a love letter to us. And it doesn't have a statute for every single situation. There are gray areas. And grace leaves areas of gray. That's one of the things we can see. Law is absolutely black and white. Do this, don't do that, an answer for everything. And see, legalism, that's what Jesus dealt with in his day, and it's still around today, which is, in those days, the Pharisees, and what the Pharisees had were legal lists. And they thought it was all about doing this and doing that and not doing this. And you know what? If God didn't give a clear command, they said, that's all right. I'll come up with one on my own. I'm pretty good at making stuff up. So if God didn't give some absolute in an area, I'll make one up and I will hold you to that standard. I will make up all these different things, every minor matter. I'm going to have it all figured out and I'm going to judge you by that standard. That's what Phariseeism, that's what legalism was all about. And Jesus came in and taught and practiced grace. Grace allows great areas of freedom. Now, of course, any time we talk about that, some people's minds immediately rush to the, yeah, but, you know, and Paul has certainly addressed those in Romans to say, you know, grace isn't just something that allows you to be free to sin, but free from sin. There is a great freedom that comes with grace, though. And what grace is really calling us to do, God is really calling us to do, is major on the majors and minor on the minors. And there are things that are major in life and there are things that are minor. And you know what? Healthy relationships, whether they're human or really even divine, you know what? They major on the majors. They're built on grace. See, a human relationship that's not built on grace isn't going to last very long because somebody's going to let you down. Somebody's going to not live up to your expectation. And so if you want to have a healthy friendship with God or with anybody for that matter, you need to understand and embrace the central truth of Romans 14. And what is it? Well, to say it again, it's God gives us grace for grace, and he expects us to do the same for others. See, I refer to this chapter here, Romans 14, constantly. When people ask me questions about gray matters, and people do all the time. They come for a pastor's perspective. They say, hey, we were having this argument. We were having this discussion. We were having this difference, and what do you think about it? What do you think we should do? Non-essentials often are the case here, and so people ask these questions. Is it okay to do this? Hey, this person seems to be able to. Does that mean it's okay for me? Can I be a Christian and still whatever it is? You know, fill in the blank. Can I follow Christ and still do this because that person does or this person doesn't or said I shouldn't? And such and so and such and such says this and someone says that. Who's right? Who's wrong in this case? Well, Romans 14 answers those questions so clearly that even the gray areas become very, very clear. And so I love that. Let's quickly get into Romans 14 and look at it in its context. Before we do, what I want to see with you is that last chapter, Romans 13, dealt with the law of the land, as I would call it. That's different than the law of the Lord, but it's an aspect of it. What is the law of the land? It's the governmental things that we 
are subject to. And God's word was very clear. You may remember Romans 13. It said, obey the law of the land. Again, sometimes people say, hey, the Bible says we're not under law. Doesn't that mean I can speed? <laughs> no, that's not what it means. It means that you're, even if you're speeding, God can <laughs> forgive you and restore you. But it doesn't mean that that is something that you're now free to do as much as you want. See, obeying the law of the land, well, that's black and white. God's word says you need to do right and not do wrong. There's not a lot of gray area in chapter 13. It just says obey, submit. And I think about it this way, police cars, we even call them this, black and whites. I know they do sometimes the little subtle shades of gray to kind of hide things, but you know what I'm talking about? You say, oh man, the black and white is behind me. Why? Because it's very clear, the contrast between those things. The, the police cars, clear contrast between right and wrong. And you see Romans 13 just said, obey the law of the land. But now as we continue into Romans 14, there's another law that's presented here. And a key understanding for us as we think about it is that the law of the land is not the highest law. It's not the highest law. It's not the highest standard. It's the lowest standard in many ways. The law of the land can only deal really with outward actions. There are no laws that have to do with attitudes, really. I mean, you can't get arrested for being grumpy, can you? <laughs> or being unthoughtful or something like that. Those aren't the, you know, oh, you weren't kind. I'm writing you a ticket. That's not the issue. The issue has to do with actions and things like that, but that's really the lowest common denominator. And a lot of times people think, hey, I'm a law-abiding citizen. Doesn't that make me a Christian? You go, Where did you get that idea? The law of the land doesn't really have much to do with anything. It's really the minimum to maintain civilization. Don't go 80 through a school zone. Okay, but that won't get you to heaven. Don't shoot people and steal their purse. Okay, but that doesn't get you to heaven. And see, you can be a law-abiding citizen and not be a Christian. It's very possible to do that. Law is not the highest standard. It's really the lowest. And so Romans 13 leaves a whole lot of unanswered questions in our life. Well, now what? See, there are many things that are lawful, but they're still awful. So you could keep a law of the land and still not even be coming close to pleasing the Lord. See, many things that are not illegal, they're still immoral. Because the law of the land doesn't always try to enforce morality, nor can it really. And so what you see sometimes is that there's something that you're not breaking any law. I didn't break any law. But we do break laws when we break the law of love. And that's what this is talking about here in this chapter. See, and there's some things that are not illegal and they're not immoral, but people still feel very strongly about them, right? They still have a very strong preference or perspective or conviction about it. And see, Romans 14 is here to tell us that, you know, you can clear away the clouds from many of those gray areas of life by appealing to a higher law than the law of the land. It's the law of love. See, love is a higher law. Love means we can be one even though we're not the same. That's what it's saying in there. And love gives grace for grace, see? Even the gray areas in life become very clear when we know and we apply the principles that are in this chapter. And I can give you again that simple sentence that summarizes this chapter, which is this. God gives us grace for the gray areas, and he expects, uh, expects us to do the same for others. And that's what it says there as we start in verse 1 of chapter 14. It says, receive one who's weak in the faith but not to disputes over doubtful things. Now, what does that mean? Well, the first word there that we see is receive, and receive's a, an important word here. It means accept. It means to embrace. It means to hold out your hand open-handed and open-hearted to a person, to welcome the weak, to give them grace. See, that's an important thing right off the start there. Receive them. And why do we receive them? So we can set them straight, right? So we can change them. That's not what it says. It says receive them, but not to disputes over these things, not to get into arguments and win them and make sure that they see things the way you see things. No, it says not to arguments over minor matters, not to debates over gray areas. See, we are to call, or we are called as Christians to major on the majors and minor on the minors. And so many things could be avoided if we would just remember that. And ask ourselves the question, what is major? What is major? Well, the Bible gives us the majors, right? Grace, acceptance, love. 
what is minor? Well, a lot of grades. There's a lot of grades out there. A lot of minor matters. Matters of personal preference. Matters of things that we have a perspective on and maybe even a reason why, a very good reason why we have that perspective, but someone else can very much have a different view of that. Non-essential, doubtful things, that's what it talks about here. Things that are not a central part of the faith. And specifically in this chapter, we're going to look at two. One is diets, the other is days. That's what it talks about. And what was minor in God's eyes became very major in people's eyes, and that's always a mistake. Whenever we are out of sync with what God says about something, well, we're going to have a problem. And this was becoming a major matter in the early church, these diets and days. Specifically, the question was, should we eat meat or should we not? Now, it was hard to find a kosher kitchen in Rome, as you might imagine. This was a, a place where really the Jewish faith was not super strong in this area. And, of course, it was even being spread out even more. And so the church was made up there, the Roman church was made up of Jews and Gentiles. Now, that in itself was a recipe for disaster, right? I mean, this is two groups that had hated each other like no one else maybe in all of history. And so you think of just throwing these two groups in together and say, okay, now love each other. Whoa, that's going to be tough. You think just getting in a marriage with one person and another person of different genders, you think that's hard. Well, this was whole different perspectives in life the Jews and Gentiles. And so often the meat in the markets had been sacrificed to idols there in Rome and in some of the outlying areas. And so some of the Christians there decided the only safe thing to do, the only right and righteous thing to do, was to not eat meat at all. They said, listen, uh, you know, the, the dietary laws, we've read some of the uh, Jewish scriptures, all the rest of the stuff, or this is our background, and we said, you know, I, I, I'm just not going to do anything because I don't know how to do it without offending something here. And other Christians said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I've read the first part of Romans. I know the gospel accounts. I know some of the stuff. I'm free in Christ. It says here in Galatians, da, 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 we're not under Levitical law. There's no clean or unclean foods. You can't put me under that standard. Bring on the surf and turf, baby, and make it quick. And see, it would have been real easy for the church to split over this issue right here. You've got to set up over here the Messianic Meat Ministry International. And then over here you have the Church of the Victorious Vegetarians. Okay, And they're going to each preach their way of doing things and practice their way of doing things, and they're going to look down on each other and say, those meat eaters, they're some carnivore, carnal Christians. That's what they are. And then you see over here veggie tails and all the rest. I bet they watch that over in the children's ministry and stuff. That would have been a very easy and natural way for things to go. But you know what? God had something supernatural for them and for us, and that's the high road. Taking the high road. What is the high road? Grace for the grays. See, the specifics change, but the principle remains. And so maybe we look at it and say, what's the big deal about meat? Exactly. What's the big deal about what day you worship? Exactly. It isn't a big deal, but it was a big deal to them, and it was becoming a big deal. And so I remind you, God gives grace in the grave, and he expects us to do the same. Now, I could make a list of controversial subjects, and probably we could start a fight right here in this place. You know that Christians oftentimes say, well, I feel this way, I feel strongly about that, let me not do too much of it, but I'll throw a few out. Movies, should we or shouldn't we? Cosmetics, should she or shouldn't she? <laughs> Alcohol, how much, what kinds? Is there a difference between wine and beer or the hard stuff? What about card playing? Can I do that? Can Christians dance? Well, some can, some can't. <laughs> Fashion, you know, what about, can I pierce this? Can I pierce that? Can I do these things? Should I do that or not? Bible translation, oh, you have the NIV, <laughs> nearly inspired version. I prefer the King James original. I actually read the original Greek. <laughs> Those kind of things. People can get into that kind of discussion. Sports, should we go to them or not? Certainly not the UM games right now. <laughs> what about music? What can I listen to? What can't I? Ford or Chevy? These could be important questions. Mac or PC, that's an important one around here. We get into some of those theological discussions. But you know, I have a personal conviction about each and every one of those areas, but I don't preach them. I don't push them. Why? Because we're supposed to major on the majors and minor on the minors. 
When it comes to our own convictions, oh, we can have them and we should have them. And this chapter is certainly saying that. We should have them. We should know why we feel strongly about what we feel strongly about. But God gives grace in the grays, and so should we. See, that's what it says there in verse 2. It says, for one believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. Let not him who eats despise him who does not eat, and let not him who does not eat judge him who eats, for God has received him. Now, verse 2 is there saying, he who is weak eats only vegetables. Now, I wish I had known where this was in the Bible when I was growing up. This would have really come in handy. But tell this to Popeye right here. Remember what he said? I'm strong to the finish because I eat me spinach, right? But it says here that you're weak if you only eat vegetables. <coughs> now, if you paid attention to the news, you know that there was an outbreak of uh, deadly E. coli bacteria on fresh spinach, and it was pulled from the shelves, and kids everywhere were rejoicing, really. <laughs> I know there was much rejoicing in our house right there. Dad, Dad, we're going to stay with the nice, safe Cheetos, you know? Those that I never heard of E. coli breaking out on a Cheeto bag or something, you know? <laughs> Junk food, it's safe. And my son would love to make this a memory verse here, Romans 14, 2. But people make dietary decisions for all types of reasons today. But you know what? This was a religious reason here in Rome. This was a, a spiritual battle that was going on, really. And it'll help you to understand the statement in context. See. Uh, the law of the Lord was really divided into three main categories. And this is important for our understanding of the whole scriptures here, which is the three sections were moral, the civil laws, and the ceremonial laws. And God's Levitical law put all of this together. As you see in the first five books of the scriptures there, you see the law of God over and over again. But three sections, moral, civil, the governmental laws and ceremonial. Now, why is that important? Because the moral things are eternal and unchangeable. I mean, murder was one of the Ten Commandments, and people say, well, we're not under law because it's New Testament now, right? Well, murder's still wrong. And not only that, but hatred, Jesus said, is really the root of murder, and that's where we're really dealing with. So, again, the moral aspect of the law, that hasn't gone away. And then you see the civil things that were there, and, and really it's interesting because the government that we enjoy here was so much founded on the principles that were there in the Judeo-Christian, as they put it, background, where you have differences between intentional murder and accidental manslaughter and differences of response to those things. That was civil law, and there's a lot we can learn from God's Word in there, but then, you know, there's ceremonial law in the Scriptures, too. There are the things with the blood sacrifices and the feast days and all of these types of things. And this food you can eat and this food you can't. You can't have shellfish. Well, now God says you can't be selfish. But you can have shellfish as long as you're not selfish. As long as I share my crab legs with you, it's okay. <laughs> as long as I give you a little bit of my lobster, everything's fine. But see, that's what it's saying there. The ceremonial laws, those are not in the same way binding today. And so that's what you're seeing in these things. They pointed to a person. That was their reason. They were symbolic. They were a parable, if you will, that pointed to the person of Jesus Christ. And there's so much in those things, and we study those things here. But the feast, the festivals, the Sabbath days, all of these things, hey, that was part of the ceremonial law, and it's not binding to us today. And so this chapter here is specifically dealing with those ceremonial issues, not moral things. Last chapter dealt with the civil things, but this is not dealing with moral issues. It's talking about diets and days. See, those are the grays. The diets and days were just part of the grays. And he's saying in here, judge not, judge not. When it comes to those things, you can't hold a standard to somebody that God has not held to them. See, that doesn't mean all of a sudden under grace, everything's gray. It doesn't mean that. The moral issues are still moral issues. But there are black and whites, there are wrong and rights in the scripture, and there are gray matters. And those gray matters, well, in many ways the scriptures say they don't matter unless they begin to matter to s separate and divide people unnecessarily. See, sin is still sin, and it's always going to be that way. That's a moral issue, and we can address that head on. We can judge that even in a sense, you know. If a person is stealing, I can say that is wrong. So don't judge me. 
well, wait a minute. I can judge you because it's not me judging you. It's God's word judging you. God's word says that's wrong and that the wages of that sin is death. I'm just agreeing with God. I'm not making up my own law. I'm subject to it. All of us are subject to it. That law will never change. It's black and white. See, all I'm doing in that case, I'm not judging someone by some standard I made up. I'm only simply agreeing with God. But see, if something's not immoral, not forbidden, not explicitly discussed in Scripture, not illegal, it becomes one of those gray areas. It becomes one of those areas where there can be debate. And the examples Paul uses here are diets and days. And so, first of all, think about the diet thing. He says here, the strong in faith eats all things. The weak eat only vegetables. What is going on here? The reason for the vegetarianism in this case is that they were weak in the faith. What does that mean? It means they were not fully convinced that God's grace was really given to them. Because they're like, well, yeah, but shouldn't we still keep these Things, and if I eat the wrong foods, isn't God going to zap me with something or do something bad to me? But it said, no, that's not what it's about. So the context here, again, ceremonial. Clean and unclean foods. That's what he's talking about. And that had distinguished Israel from the nations, but now God was sending the church out into the nations. And he's saying, you know, it's not going to be the food that you do or don't eat. It's going to be the love that you do or do not show to people that's going to make the difference. See, eat whatever you want. Peter, he said to him, go into the house of a Gentile and have at it, man. Don't worry about it. It's not about that. And Jesus had specifically said, it's not what goes in a guy's mouth. It's what got, comes out of a guy's heart that defiles him. So Jesus himself had made this issue very, very clear. And yet still some Christians from a certain background would say, and I better have salad and no bacon bits, please. No little ham things, no way. And it's similar maybe to the beliefs that some have that, man, you got to have fish on Friday. And if you don't, thank God it's Friday, something bad's going to happen to you. You know, you, you better do that because it's just part of what is in their mind, but not necessarily what's in God's word. And so this concern was deeper even than just dietary things. Because there was an idolatry issue. See, that was maybe even the bigger issue. Some really struggled with the fact that there at the meat market, they might be buying beef that somebody had sacrificed to a false god. There was no real way for them to know for sure, but it happened a lot. They would sacrifice to the gods, and they'd say, well, might as well bring it on to the uh, store and sell it, make some money afterwards. And so... Certainly, sacrificing to idols is black and white issue. It's wrong. Idolatry like that is wrong. False gods. God, we're not to worship any other god. But is buying beef that somebody else sacrificed to a false god and you didn't even know it, is that wrong? Well, some would say yes. Some would say no. It's a gray area. I don't know for sure. For some person, it's wrong. For some person, it's right. And see, that's a very subtle thing there. It's a gray area. It's one of the grays. And the weak one, it says here, would say, man, I don't know where that beef's been. It's better just to eat veggies here to be sure. You know, I, I did, I'm pretty sure nobody sacrificed this carrot to a, to a god, you know. <laughs> and then the strong one would, would say, look, I've been saved by grace. It's what's in my heart. It's not what goes in my mouth that it defiles me. It's what comes out of my heart. Jesus himself said that. I'm no idolater. Hand me that hamburger and don't ask any questions. <laughs> and so... It's interesting to me that the legalistic one is not the one who's described as strong. The legalistic one is described here as weak. Isn't that interesting? Sometimes in our lives, we, we look at somebody who's real restrictive and everything and uh, all this stuff and go, wow, they're really strong spiritually, you know? They, they've taken a vow of celibacy and poverty and misery and they only eat things that taste bad and wear clothes that look bad and they sleep on a bed of nails. Wow. They're so spiritual. They must really be holy. But the scriptures here say, no, actually, they're the weak one. In many cases, that's the truth, that somebody who's living with all that is trying to do a bunch of stuff to please God when he says, hey, you know what pleases me? To believe in the one that I sent. See, God's grace gives us great freedom. To sin? No. From sin. But there are so many wide open areas that God has given us the Bible says the truth will set you free. The more we know of God's grace, the more we experience God's grace, the freer we get. And when the Spirit of the Lord is there, the Bible says we experience freedom. Think back to Genesis. God said, of 
you can only eat this one tree and everything else you can't touch. That's not how he said it, was it? Sometimes we get mad and we say, why did he set a tree there that they couldn't touch? It says they could have it all except the one thing. And, of course, they gravitated to that one thing and got mad at God for not letting them have that one thing. That's sin. But, see, God's grace is huge. He said, of all this fruit, I made it for you. Go ahead. And God's grace is exceedingly large. And his restrictions are exceedingly few, and they are for our benefit when they are there. And the more grace we embrace, the more we understand that, the more freedom we find, and not freedom to sin, but freedom from sin, and to live our lives by the law of love, which is the most freeing of all laws. See, and everybody's weak in some areas and strong in others. Sometimes we think, oh, I'm the weak one or I'm the strong one. You know what? We have a mixture in our lives, always. And in nearly every situation, we're going to encounter people who maybe have a hang-up where we don't, or we have a hang-up where they don't. And neither of us really are right or wrong, but it's just the way things are. And you look at those things, and what we want to do is not despise each other for those things and get all high and mighty because we don't have something that someone else does in their life that's holding them back. And I have an interesting observation, at least it's true in my life. You know what I have a tendency to think? Just because I'm selfish, unlike you. And, and what it is th that oftentimes I think anyone who's more restrictive than I am is a legalist. Legalist, bunch of legalists. And then anyone who's a little maybe freer in an area than I am, and I've decided to restrict myself in that, what a heathen, what a carnal, <laughs> look at that backslider, man. When they get serious <laughs> about Christ, they will be exactly where I am. Not a legalist over here, not this. Why? I, I become the standard by which all things are judged. But I thought Jesus was the standard by which all things are judged. And that's what it says in this scripture here. I went to someone's house the other day, and I was thinking, these people have wonderful taste. And you know what I realized? They had the same furniture we did. <laughs> uh, I looked over, and they had the same exact couch from the same exact store we did. And I thought, man, these people have great taste. Why? Because it's mine. <laughs> See, and if it's someone else's, eh, I don't like it. These people have poor taste in furniture because it's not mine. And so often it's that way, our natural tendency to believe our way is the right way and the only way, really, right? And as I said at the intro, you know, relationships, isn't that really what so much of marriage and friendship and family, all that friction that goes on in those things so often? Is it really that we're arguing the deity of Christ? No. We're getting no grace in some gray area where it's the way you squeeze the tube of toothpaste becomes this monumental thing. <laughs> my way. See, and I used to think my way was right and my wife's way was wrong. And I've come to realize now after 17 years, it's exactly the opposite. Her way is right and mine's wrong. And maybe eventually we'll figure out a something in the middle. But you see, Romans 14 says, you know what? I need to learn to accept both those who are more restricted than I am and those who are maybe exercising a freedom that I've chosen not to. Why? Because verse 3 says God has received them. That should be enough right there. If God doesn't reject them, how can I? How can I say, oh, God, you're kind of letting it loose, aren't you? Letting people in. I wouldn't have let them in. There was an old joke that said I would never be a member of a club that would accept me as a member. You know, that, that's the kind of standard. If, they, if their standard's so low that they'd let a guy like me in, I wouldn't want to join it. And that's the thing that you see here. God, is his standard too high? Is it too low? You know what? It says there, if God has received him, that's good enough for me. And God gives us grace for the grace, but you know what? He expects us to do the same for others. The grace that he gives us, hey, it's only right. So it says there in verse 4, who are you to judge another servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. See, I love this because what it's saying to us basically is it's God's job to judge and our job to love. See, a lot of times we think, hey, I'll take over the judging, God. You love them, I'll judge them. But it's really the other way around. I'm not saying we never deal with sin in a very serious way. Hey, of course we do because we love people enough to confront those things when it's there and correct those things. But I'm talking about getting away from the critical, self-centered spirituality that says I'm right and everybody else is wrong and I am more right the more I make you wrong. That kind of thing, that condemnation, that's not anything that's going to bring anybody to Christ. I 
love this story and I want to share it with you real quickly. It's an author wrote this little parable and I just want to read down through it for you. And you'll get the point as you see it. There were two men who met on a street and one of them, each one of them, was carrying a Bible. And so they started a conversation there and the guy said, hey, I see you have a Bible. Are you a believer? And the other said, why, yes, I am. I am a believer. Excited that someone had seen his Bible. And so the man there said, you know, I've learned you cannot be too careful these days. Let me ask you a few questions to make sure you're really a believer. Do you believe in the virgin birth of Christ? Absolutely, the man said. How about the deity of Christ? Oh, you betcha, he was God. How about his death on the cross? What was that all about? Well, he died and he rose again to pay the price for my sin that I might be forgiven. The man began to think to himself, man, could it be that I'm face to face with a real live Christian? A real brother in Christ, perhaps, but nevertheless, I'd better continue on my checklist. And so he did. He said, how are we saved? He said, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone, not by works so that no one could boast. The guy said, oh, that's good. That's good. I like that. What do you think about the return of Christ? The man said, it's imminent. It could happen any minute. The man said, wow, what, what about the Bible? Well, it's inspired by God. That's why I'm carrying it with me now. And the other guy, his heart began to beat faster. And he said, well, hey, what's your church background? And the guy said, well, my holy heritage is Southern Congregationalist, Holy Son of God, Dispensationalist throne, Triune Contribution Convention. <laughs> and the man said, wow, that's mine too. And the man said, well, what, what branch, though? And he said, well, I, we're part of the premillennial, post-trib, non-charismatic, King James, foot-stomping, hand-clapping, <laughs> one-cup communion branch. And the man's eyes began to mist over, and he said, that's how I grew up. I only have one more question left. He said, at, at your church, is the pulpit, is it made of wood or is it fiberglass? And the man said, fiberglass. And he said, you heretic, and slapped him and walked away. See, now you think about that. It seems stupid, but people do that kind of thing in a smaller way every single day. And most of us are really good at spotting differences in people and the things that we don't agree on. And here Paul's saying, you know what, if you want to point out a person who needs to change, why don't you just look no further than yourself? If you want to judge something, start with judging this. See, that's what he says in verse 4. He says, judge this make a point of it don't judge another servant trust God see let God be God in your life and let him be God in someone else's life that's so important because sometimes we think well God's doing a lot in my life but he's not doing enough in their life and if I could just get in there and help God out a lot you know especially my wife you know I, it, I just really think I'd make a great Holy Spirit in the home you know Lord <laughs> And, and I remind you again, God's given us grace for the grace. And he expects us to do the same for others. Trust the Lord to work on others just like he's working on you. And it says there he's able. He's able to make them stand strong no matter how weak they may appear to us. See, one person, it says in verse 5, esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord. He who does not observe the day, to the Lord he does not observe it. He who eats, eats to the Lord. He who gives God thanks, he who does not eat, to the Lord he does not eat, and he gives God thanks. Now, verse 5, I love this because it says, let each be fully convinced in his own mind. Don't walk away from this thinking, oh, everything's gray and I shouldn't have any convictions. No, this says... You ought to have convictions. You ought to have strong convictions on things and know why you believe even some of the minor matters maybe. It's okay to feel strongly about things as long as it doesn't become a divisive issue. See, he says you can be fully convinced in your own mind. A word of warning here is that this is not applying to moral and civil law that's black and white. A criminal, you know, saying, hey, I'm fully convinced in my own mind that it was okay to rob that house. You can't judge me. It says so in Scripture. Judge not, lest you be judged. Well, the judge isn't going to buy that, is they? are they? No, they're not. Not as they're a good judge. See, this chapter, again, it's about doubtful things. It's about debatable things. It's about gray areas. And the transition that happens there in verse 6, it talks now about days. See, we talked about diets. And what were they arguing about there? Well, we ought to keep the Sabbath. 
You know, we ought to make sure that we're keeping the Passover in the right way and all this sort of thing. They were wanting to maintain those ceremonial things, and that's okay. But there were others saying, hey, we, the Lord's Day is Sunday. We ought to worship on Sunday. And others are saying, hey, every day's the same. What's the big? And so the, here comes Paul to say, you know what? You're all right. You're all right. You should worship on Sunday. If that's where, where you are fully convinced in your own mind that it's all about Sunday, then you worship on Sunday. Saturday, if you're a Saturday person, Saturday night, you know? Saturday night's all right for fighting? Eh, no, but Saturday night's all right for worship. And so that's what he's saying here. Every day's the same to you? That's fine. Notice the focus being on God. To the Lord, it says four times in there. To the Lord, to the Lord they do this, to the Lord. The law of love starts with the Lord. You do what you do, fully convinced in your own mind, because you have the mind of Christ. And you say, this is what God is calling me to do. I know this is what he wants me to do. And notice that both people, or all of these people here, are doing it right, even though they were doing it differently. Isn't that interesting? A lot of times we think, oh, if it's different, it's wrong. That's not necessarily true. And it says there that they give God thanks. Two people, two perspectives, two different prayers. Think about it this way. First prayer, God, I thank you for this big old slab of beef that I'm about to take part of here on this Sunday brunch. I mean, that's the prayer, right? The other person is, is there on Saturday, and they got their spinach salad, and they're saying, Lord, please protect me from that E. coli. I don't want to <laughs> die. I really don't. See, both are right with God in that prayer. They're giving thanks. They're thankful for what they have. They're fully convinced in their own mind. They don't agree with each other, but they're okay with God. And both will become wrong if they start to disagree on something that doesn't matter and let that become a divisive thing when it shouldn't. And so if they start to judge and despise each other, oh, this thing that didn't matter begins to matter. And so verse 7, it says, None of us lives to himself. None of us died to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. Just for this end, Christ died and rose and lived again, that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Now, the key point of those, I just want to summarize it down quickly. It's, that he might be Lord. Isn't that amazing? Why did he live and die? So that we could eat certain foods and fight over that, have a food fight? No, he says, that I might be Lord of your life. See, that's the reason he died and rose again. I'm not anybody's Lord. Isn't that nice? Nobody in here has me as their Lord, and be thankful to the Lord for that. <laughs> but see, the Bible says, I'm not even my own Lord. Isn't that great? I don't even run my own life. Now I have a Lord. Because he died and he rose again. And you know what that means? My whole life can be lived to please him. And if there's one thing I've found, you can't please people, but you can please God. Many people think you can't please God, but they're running around trying to please people. You know what? God's actually fairly easy to please in many ways. Faith pleases him. Love pleases him. Our service pleases him. That's the major. Living for the Lord, loving people. That's what Jesus said. That's the big deal. The minor stuff is everything else that isn't eternal, all the stuff that won't go with us. And you know what? The only thing that goes with us is the people whose lives we touched. And in heaven, most things will not matter. You will not still be debating many of the things that we debate down here. And if it doesn't matter in eternity, why does it matter so much here? That's what Paul is saying in this. Why judge your brother, verse 10? Why do you show contempt for your brother? We all are going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it's written, as I live, said the Lord. Every knee will bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us will give account of himself to God. Now this is incidentally just one of the majors that's in here, because all throughout this chapter it's very clear that Jesus is God, and all throughout the Scripture. That is one of the non-debatable black and white issues of scripture, scripture, the judgment seat of Christ. And it talks about standing before God and the Lord, and it puts all these together. You see Philippians 2 quotes this same section and makes it very clear that Jesus is the almighty maker of heaven and earth. And he's the eternal Lord for which we will all give account of our lives to him. He's the judge of all. Jesus was not just a good man, as many will say, but he was God as a man. And that's important. That's not a gray area. That's black and white. That's the difference between saved and lost, heaven and hell. And see, there are some gray areas, but that's not one of them. There are areas that cannot be changed or altered or debated 
without serious loss. And the deity of Christ there is absolutely essential. It's an immovable truth of scripture. It is the common bond we have. And I like to think of it this way. In a house, in a building here at the church, or maybe in your home, there are two kinds of walls. There are walls that are what are called load-bearing walls, and there are walls that are decorative, okay? And those are very important to know the difference between those two things. A decorative wall can be moved. You say, I wanna blow this out and make this room a little bigger. Great, no problem. You can even do it yourself. Just start sledgehammering it down, kick it down. Doesn't matter, it's decorative. It's not holding anything up. But then there's something called a load-bearing wall. And if you decide, I don't like this wall, I'm gonna move it. Well, guess what? The roof is gonna cave in and the house is gonna fall down. Why? Because it's integral to the structure. And so the gray areas that we're talking about of the faith, well, those are decorative walls. Those are things that you can move without much importance. But you know what? You better know before you move a wall whether it's load-bearing or not. And there are things in the scripture that you move that and you lose the whole thing. And the grace of God cannot be moved. The cross of Christ cannot be moved. And those are load-bearing things. It's holding the whole thing up, holding us up. And one of those truths is that Jesus is the judge of all. We will all stand before him for ourselves, the Bible says, not for somebody else. See, a lot of us would love to stand before the Lord for somebody else, right? Uh, either good or bad. You know, I'll stand before him and I won't say nothing. I'll let the guy get judged. You know, I won't come to their aid. I'd really like that. Or somebody else, you say, oh, I wish I could stand in my friend's place. You know, but the Bible here says that we will all stand before the Lord individually. Individually. And the seat that it's talking there, it's a seat called the Bema seat in the scripture. Why is this important? Because there's two different judgments in the scripture. There's the judgment for sin that says unbelievers will stand before that. But there's the judgment of service that believers will stand before, not to be judged for their sin, but to be rewarded for their service and to be rewarded for whether they lived a life of love like it's talking about here. A saved person will go to heaven, but that doesn't mean that everybody's experience and reward will be the same by God's grace. And the surest sign of someone who has received God's grace is someone who freely gives it. See, if someone's a fault finder, you can pretty much know this is not someone who's living in God's grace. But when somebody is really giving out God's grace and embracing that and embracing others, as it says to do here, well, that's somebody who has experienced the God, the grace of God. See, God has given us grace in the black and white and in the grays. And he expects us to do the same for others. Now, you might be asking at this point as we close it out, how do I live by this law of love? What does it look like? You know, how, how can I really practically see it? And that's what he's turning the corner here. He's, he's coming here to a, another one of his therefores, you know, in, in the scripture when he says, now, given everything that I've said, this is what it's there for. And he says, therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fail in our brother's way. See, now we're getting to the heart of what this chapter is all about. The issue here is this, that the law of love is others oriented. It's not about my rights and my liberties and here's what I can do and this is my perspective. It's what can I do to show love? What's the loving thing to do? It's, it's about not pointing fingers at people so much and there's a problem, there's a problem. It's being part of the solution, lending a helping hand to it. And see, verse 13 makes a distinction here. It says you're either a stepping stone that someone can get on and, and go up, or you're a stumbling stone that when somebody trips over you, they fall. They're not going further into freedom. They're going further into bondage. And so in our lives, we are either stepping stones or stumbling stones, and those are the choices. And God is calling us to use the freedom that he has given us by his grace to set others free, to give others freedom, to give others that same liberty that he's given us. And see, there's two main ways that you can make someone stumble. And sometimes we think of this one, that, you know, if I'm a real sinner and I'm just terrible and I'm a real hypocrite, obviously, and always in these terrible things and obvious hypocrisy in my life, oh, someone's going to stumble with that. But you know what? Sometimes what makes a person stumble more is when they come across one of these look-down-your-nose, pharisaical, legalistic Christians who say, God hasn't really accepted you. You haven't lived up to this standard and put this weight, this heavy weight that Jesus said even they can't bear. And he says, you know, that is not what it's about. That can cause someone to stumble even quicker than just outright sin and hypocrisy, that pride. See, Jesus, this is what's great about him. He wasn't a perfectionist, but he was perfect. 
You ever been around a perfectionist, somebody who no matter what you do, you always fall short? No matter how great you are, it's always the one little thing that it, they notice? That is so frustrating. You want to run away from a person like that, and yet what happened? Sinners ran to Jesus. Why? He was perfect, but he wasn't a perfectionist. He wasn't somebody who was always pointing out the flaws. No, he was always giving grace. Isn't that amazing? He had people flock to him. And when we are like him, we will have people flock to us that we could give them grace in the grace, and we could give them the grace of Christ. He offered a helping hand, not a finger in the face. And you see verse 14, is, he says, I know I'm convinced by the Lord Jesus that there's nothing unclean in itself. But to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Now, this is why context is, clean, is, is king. We're seeing in here such an important thing. Some have lifted this verse. It's funny how uh, certain people know certain Bible verses, and that's the only one they know. You know, Nothing is unclean in itself. That's why I'm taking uh, heroin, because it's, it's not unclean in itself. I mean, God made it sort of, didn't he? I mean, I'm smoking pot because, hey, nothing's unclean in itself, right? I mean, this is good stuff. It's natural. It's herbs. It's vegetables, sort of. You know, I don't eat meat. I do this, you know. But it says right here, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. If something's clearly immoral, if something's clearly illegal, it's not to be part of our lives. Again, we're talking about the debatable things, the disputable things, the ceremonial things, the days and the diets that they were here, the gray matters. And it has to be something that really does fall into that category. And so you see here in verse 15, he says, but here's the thing. If these things are morally neutral, they can stop being morally neutral and they can go negative. How? If your brother is grieved because of your food, you're no longer walking in love. See the law of love there? You're no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with your food the one for whom Jesus died. Just thinking of it this way, if somebody you love is uh, diabetic or trying to lose weight or something, you're free to have a big box of Krispy Kremes there and just eat them one by one right in front of them. Oh, that's great. <laughs> wow. But guess what? You're not walking in love. You're not walking in love at that point. So if, are you free? Yes. What are you using your freedom for? Good question. See, walking in love is thinking of the other person, not myself. Not what can I do, but what should I do? What's the loving thing to do? The weakest one, considering them. See, we have three kids. We have a 12-year-old, we have a 10-year-old, we have a 5-year-old. And it's a constant battle for them to really adjust their lives to the younger ones. Sometimes we'll say, yep, it's time for bed. Time for bed? I'm 12. You know, can I stay up till 12? And you go, wait a minute. The youngest one needs to go to bed. I need to go to bed. <coughs> I'm the weakest one. I'm tired. You know, and so you're going to adjust to that. We're not going to stay awake and keep her awake. We're going to go and adjust to that. You know, that's walking in love. When they play, she doesn't get it. When they play games, she knocks over the board and starts, ah, you know, but she's the five-year-old. She has some growing to do. And love will voluntarily and joyfully even adjust itself for the weaker one. We ride bikes. And it used to be that the kids were the weaker ones, and I had to go slow for them. Now I have to, hey, hey, slow down for dad, you know. <laughs> <sighs> That's the grace in the grays, remember? The more gray I get, the more grace I need. And so it says, therefore, don't let your good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. It's righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. He's saying there in verse 16, don't let the good things, which is the freedom we have in Christ, the liberty we have in Christ, the grace that God has given, don't let that become something that actually ends up being blasphemed, talked badly about. Oh, yeah, they're free, all right. They're free to walk all over people and treat people <coughs> badly and look down on people. That's what they're free to do. He's saying, you know, use your freedom in Christ to build others up. That's what we should do, to major on the major. And the Pharisees were so obsessed with the externals and the things that didn't matter at all, that they did not pay attention to the eternals that mattered most. And that's what Jesus got on their case for. He said, you know, you've forsaken mercy and grace and love and forgiveness. That's what it's really all about. And yet you paid attention to every minute matter. That's the biggies there. Righteousness, wow, that's our relationship with God. Peace, that's our relationship with each other. Joy, that's our relationship with what's going on in our own heart. And he says, that's what it's really all about. That's what Jesus really came to change. And verse 18, it says, he who serves Christ in these things 
is acceptable to God and approved by men. Therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which we may edify one another. Don't destroy the work of God for the sake of food. Indeed, all things are pure, but it is evil for the man who eats with offense. He's just saying there, hey, pursue peace. Accommodate others. Accept others in those gray matters. This weekend uh, was the couples retreat, and every year for the past several years, a family friend who is a vegetarian has watched our kids. Now, again, our kids are not vegetarians. They're the exact opposite, whatever that is, you know. And, and so a mac and cheese-itarian, I don't know, or a, a, a burger-itarian. And so she, when, when the kids come over, here's the thing. She accommodates them. She goes and buys hot dogs, which they like. She goes and buys chocolate chip cookies. And you know what? Here's the thing. She doesn't force them to eat what she eats, and they don't force her. They don't hold her down and say, you're free in Christ, have a hot dog. You know? <laughs> she doesn't do that. They just love each other. They love each other. They cried when we came home. You know, most kids cry when their parents go away. Our kids cry when we come home. I try to not take it too personally. But, but that's, that's the love, that though they're different, you know. And so he's saying, look for those things. That's the grace, the grace that God can give. Don't let your rights become wrong. And he sums it up in this last sentence, and this is such a beautiful verse to end on. It says, it is good neither to eat meat nor drink wine nor do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or made weak. See, you think about that. That could mean, hey, we're... We're at the mercy of the weakest person. You know, someone can put a legalistic trip on it. That's not it. That's not it at all. What it's saying is that love doesn't insist on every liberty. It adjusts to the needs and sensitivities of another person. When a two-year-old comes to our house, we don't say, we have a right to have sharp things within arm's reach. No, we say, you know what? Because of our love, we're going to voluntarily limit a freedom we have to put those scissors in another spot. And that's all he's saying there. He says, do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself and what he approves. And check this out. He says, he who doubts is condemned if he eats because he doesn't eat from faith. I want to leave that little phrase with you. There it is at the end, verse 23. Whatever is not from faith is sin. Doesn't that clear, clarify a lot of stuff? Says, Can I do this? Well, I don't know. Do you have faith to do it? Do you have faith that the Lord is calling you to do it? Are, are you trusting it? Has God clearly prohibited it, well, then you can't have faith to do it. But if he's given you freedom to do it and you have peace in your heart that you are going to do it, do it. If it doesn't hurt somebody else, do it. But if you can't do it from faith, don't do it. Whatever's not of faith is sin. And that clears so many clouds in my life. It makes so many things that were gray very crystal clear. The question's not how close to sin can I get without going over. <sighs> No, it's how close to Christ can I get? And how many people can I take along with me? See, faith opens up a whole lot more doors than it closes. And that's what we see in our scriptures. God has given us so much freedom. Don't you love him for that? And the question is, do I want people conformed to Christ's image or mine? See, that's, a, that's an important question to think through as a Christian. For far too many churches and far too many Christians, far many, too many preachers are just preaching their preferences. Hey, you got to dress and look like this. You ought to have this kind of thing. But, you know, if somebody has a real strong conviction in a gray area, this is all I ask them, which is to let me observe their life and see how that conviction has made them more Christ-like, more fruitful, more loving. And I'll come to them and say, hey, what do you th what's your secret? What do you, how do you live your life in such a way like this? But not just laying it on someone else. And it's been said in the Christian world this way very well. In essentials unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. That's just a word for grace, for love. And so God has given us grace in the grace. He expects us to do the same for others. And we spend far too much time sometimes majoring on the minors and minoring on the majors. And the major is this, Jesus Christ. See, that's what I love about it. That's where all grace comes from, for the grays and for the black and whites. And before we close out. We're going to close out in a song, but I'm just going to ask the simple black and white question, which is, do you know him? Do you know that Jesus? It's not about religion. It's not about, well, if I don't have fish on 
Friday or I do have fish on Friday or I didn't do this. Or I, no, it's what have you done with him? The Bible says those who have the son have life. Those who don't have the son don't have life. See, that's black and white. That's clear. My sin was as black as night. And the Bible says he washed me as white as snow. See, that's clear. There's no gray area there. We're saved by grace alone, by faith alone, in Jesus alone. Have you made that decision? If you haven't, I would invite you to do it. You know, life without the Lord is gray. <laughs> it's very gray. It can be black, but sometimes it's just gray. See, black and white, sometimes that's at least, you know, you can see things very clearly, but uh, there's nothing worse than living a gray life. Just kind of, a, I don't have any firm convictions. I don't have any strong beliefs. I don't even know what I believe. I believe everything and nothing. That's a, that's a gray, drab, dull, terrible life. And God has come to pour grace into our lives, which just brings it to life, abundant life, eternal life. That's what he has called us to. And when we share that with people, oh, they're going to run to it. If we share legalism with people, they're going to run from it the same way we would, the same way maybe we did. But it's Jesus himself who calls to us. And I just invite you uh, to come to him as we stand together.